Bibles uh, with me to Ephesians chapter 4 and 5, somewhere in there. When we get there, we'll figure it out. It's close. You're close. Get to Ephesians 4, actually. So t- this morning and next Sunday morning, we'll probably finish this series on forgiveness, unforgiveness, bitterness, anger, the roots, uh, how it affects so many. And uh, we'll start here this, this morning, if you'll stand with me by reading here in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30, where the Bible says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you as a church body, as a church family here, and we just confess that we absolutely need you. We need you in every possible way. Lord, we're weak, and we need your strength. And We come before you needing your grace, your mercy. Some people are here today, they're just so discouraged. And they come needing your encouragement. And Father, you know the needs. And you are capable of meeting every single need. We pray for those souls here this morning that are just not, they're just not born again. They don't know you as their Savior. And we pray that today would be the day of that person's salvation. We know the devil loves for your children to be caught up in all kinds of bondage. And we pray that today they'd that we would be broken free of bondage. Uh, that the bondage of bitterness would be broken in this place today. That the Spirit of God would move in and among us and take the Word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit, and would just wield the sword of the Spirit in such a way that the chains of darkness and the chains of bondage would be easily broken by the Word of God today. And we would leave this place victorious in the person of Jesus Christ, we pray for those that are sick that just couldn't be here, and we pray for all of us that are here to receive all that you have for us, and we ask you this now in Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. I feel like I need to real quickly kind of catch us up. We started off in Matthew chapter 18. In Matthew 18, there's a, a man that owes a debt that is so large that if he were to save every penny he ever made for the rest of his life, he could never pay it. And a king finds out about it and brings him before him. The the, the man falls on his face and basically begs for mercy and grace before the king. And the king is getting ready to sell the man's wife and his kids and put him in debtor's prison because there's no way he can pay this debt. But instead, the man cries out to the king and tells him, I will pay thee all. But the thing is, there's no way he could pay all because the debt is more than you could make in a lifetime. But the king's heart's touched and broken, if you will, and he gives him grace, and he gives him mercy, and he forgives the debt. Psh, wipes it out. You no longer owe me anything. Then that same man goes and finds somebody that owes him about two days, three days, four days tops of a debt. That man falls and begs for mercy and says, I'll pay thee all. You know I will. I can do that. People can pay three or four days worth of debt. And the one that had been forgiven so much won't even forgive three or four days' worth of debt. Puts him in debtor's prison. The king finds out about it and is very disappointed. And sends tormentors to torment this one. And that's what happens when we don't forgive. We're tormented. The person who won't forgive... (laughs) Unforgiveness destroys its own container. Bitterness destroys its own container. And then the, the, the next passage that we spend a lot of time in is Hebrews chapter 12, where it talks about bitterness d- destroying that person, but also many other people being defiled. And it talks about a root of bitterness. It talks about this mara, this root of bitterness. And in the Old Testament, we see Naomi, whose name means pleasant, leaving the house of bread and the place of praise, leaving Bethlehem, Judah, because they'd heard that things were better over in Moab. And they go over to Moab and Elimelech, whose name means my God is king, and Naomi, whose name means pleasant. They had these two boys sick and pining. They named them sick and pining. They made them, named them Malon and Chilion. 
And the best that you're ever going to produce outside of God's perfect will for your life will be sick and pining. But they marry empty and satisfied. They, sick and pining, marry Orpha and Ruth, empty and satisfied. But Orpha is empty and, and Ruth isn't satisfied. And yet, Elimelech dies there. They were just going to sojourn. And this is how life is, you guys. This is why God puts all this stuff in the Bible. You know, I'm not really going to stay out of God's will. I know I'm out of God's will now, but I won't stay. I'll just sojourn and I'll come right back. But Elimelech dies there, and Malon dies there, and Chilion dies there, and Pleasant becomes bitter there. Naomi becomes bitter. And she says, I'm getting ready to go back. And Orpha says, well, I want to come with you. And Ruth says, I want to come with you. And Naomi says, no, you guys go back. Just go back. Even if I lived to be really old and had more kids, you wouldn't want to wait on more boys. Just go back. You know what she said? Go to hell. Just go to hell. Go back to your false gods. There's only one way from earth to heaven, that's through Jesus. The people of Moab did not know the way to heaven. Naomi had gotten so far from God that she literally tells her, her daughters-in-law, go to hell. But Ruth says, no, I'm not going back there. Your God's going to be my God. And as weak as Naomi's testimony was, there was a spark of God in it. And Ruth says, your God's going to be my God, and your people are going to be my people. And I'm going to go where you go. And so she goes back. And Naomi comes back into town and says, don't call me pleasant. Call me bitter. I went out full. Then why did you go? At the time, I didn't realize it, but I went out full, and I came back empty. And the very best that the world has to offer is not as good as the worst that you'll go through walking with God. The thing is, it never looks that way. And so she got fooled by it, and Elimelech got fooled by it, and Pleasant went out pleasant and came back bitter. So we talked about that. We talked about all these offshoots. See, you know, the root, the root grows a tree, right? And the tree reproduces and these little, these little things float off. These little seeds float off. And what happens when we become uh, bitter? Well, we, it comes out. Bitterness is like a poison that flows. So yeah, I think you're there. Ephesians chapter 4, we'll go back there, verse 31. It says, let all bitterness, it's like this poison that's inside of us. No one can see it. No one knows about it. We know about it sometimes. We may not even be that aware of it. But when we have these little things happen in our lives, but these great big reactions to them, even we're aware of it. Wow, where did that come from? It may take a little figuring it out, but it came from unforgiveness. It came from bitterness that's coursing through you. This poison's just coursing through you. And then wrath, and wrath is like a slow burn. Wrath is this... This explosion waiting to happen, but it hasn't happened. So far, I've been able to control it. But one of these days, one of these days, if I don't forgive and if I don't let go of this bitterness, this wrath which is or this bitterness which has turned to wrath and is now anger just waiting to explode will explode, and kaboom, I blow up. And once I've blown up at work, or once I've blown up at church, or once I've blown up in my family, or once I've blown up somewhere where I'm embarrassed that I blew up, now I have to fix it. So clamor. And this is just how it works. This is God's word. This is why we do what we do. Clamor. You know, if people understood why I did what I did, I'm not going to really talk bad about them. I'm not going to tell the whole story. I'm just going to tell them enough that everyone will understand that I'm actually a really good guy and I handled myself pretty well. If most people wouldn't handle themselves as well as I did. But here's the problem, and, and, and if, if you've ever had unforgiveness in your heart and gotten bitter, you know what I'm saying is true. And if you haven't, you know what I'm saying is true because it's right out of the Bible. No one's going to buy it. They were there when this happened, and this was your response. They're not going to buy your clamor. So then you're going to try that for a while. A person try that for a while, and then they're just going to go, well, the problem is, okay, didn't want to have to do this. 
Didn't want to have to do this, but now I'm just going to spell it out. I'm going to tell exactly what those people did to me so everyone understands that no, my explosion was justified. And so we tell the story and we're just waiting for people to go uh, in, to be in amazement about how well we did handle it. Nobody is in amazement about how well we did handle it because they were there and they saw this turn into this. They're not going to buy that either. So man, what all I have left? I've been bitter and wrathful and anger and clamor and evil speaking. Well, now you just don't really have anything left but hate. Nobody bought my story. People are actually thinking bad of me when they don't even understand what happened to me. They don't understand why I'm so mad. They don't understand why I'm so bitter. They don't understand why my temperature my temperature's so short. It's only 93. But uh, why my temper is so short. And even when they did understand, they didn't care. Look what they did to me. They made me act like this, and then they made all these people I love kind of push me away. No, they didn't do any of that. Every bit of that was you. 100% of that was you. It was your response to something terrible that happened. Now, I am not here to belittle what happened. What happened to people is horrible. Horrible. You will not get through this life without a bunch of horrible, horrible injustices happening to you. But those injustices will not be what makes or breaks your life. Your response to those injustices will be what makes or breaks your life. And if we choose to be bitter and not forgive, if we choose to not forgive, we're choosing to be bitter, and it's going to lead to wrath, and it's going to lead to anger, and it's going to lead to these explosions, which is going to lead to the clamor, which is going to lead to the evil speaking, which is going to lead to me kind of feeling like nobody buys my story, and they're kind of rejecting me when it's really their fault. And now I just kind of don't even want to be around people. I'm just kind of mad at the world. And it's just not going to get better. I wish I could tell you, oh, just stay mad at the world for this long and all of a sudden you'll be happy with it. It's not going to happen. The only thing you can do is forgive them. So, this is where we pick up this morning. Reasons that compel me to forgive. Turn with me, you're there. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32. It says, And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, tender-hearted, not hard-hearted, Tender-hearted, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. You know, we want to stay close to the cross. That cross reminds us what Jesus did for us. That cross reminds us of the greatest love that mankind has ever heard of or ever will hear of when perfect God came down to this sinful world and died for my sin on the cross of Calvary. Don't ever get too far away from the cross. Now, we praise God that it didn't end at the cross. Don't get too far away from the tomb either. And go ahead and peek in there now and then. It's empty. And he is a conqueror and he is a deliverer. But he died for my sin on the cross of Calvary. And I just don't have the right to not forgive people. It's really kind of a slap in the face of Almighty God. Now, let me just say something about Almighty God. He is Almighty, powerful God. He can take a slap in the face. If you think, man, I don't know how how he can even handle a guy like me. He can handle a guy like you. He's not having any trouble handling a guy like you. If you're truly born again, he's still crazy about you, and he is just sad at the way you're destroying your own life. But he is still crazy about you. That is not what, God's not up there like, man, I don't know if I can take any more of this. He's almighty, all-powerful God. You're not even denting him. It is something that reveals to you and I that, man, we must be getting our eyes off of what Jesus did for us. If we can hang on to what man did to me and think I can hang on, like, how can we keep saying 
How do we justify this thing that it's okay that Jesus died on the cross for my sin? He paid the ultimate price for my sin. God died for me. But I'm not going to forgive them. I owed a lifetime of debt, more than I could ever pay if I worked every single day of my life. And this is what's wrong with religion. Religion says, no, you can, you can actually pay up. You just do everything we tell you to do, and if you do it just like we say, then, then that's what, what happens is Jesus died on this side of the equation, and you earned it over here. And it balances out, and God says, okay, good. That is not what God says. <laughs> In Romans eleven six, 6, he says it's either of grace, because grace can only be grace without works, or it's work, because work can only be work without grace. You can't have both. Grace cancels out works, and works cancels out grace. Religion says it's works. Jesus says it's grace. You've got to pick. Hope you'll pick with Jesus, because he's going to be our judge. Now turn with me to... The first Peter chapter two. So when we get our eyes off the cross and we get our eyes away from our sin cost Jesus, it's easy for easier for us to not forgive others. First Peter chapter two and verse twenty says. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults ye shall take it patiently? But if when ye do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but listen, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. It is not your job to fix everybody. You commit yourself to God. So what do I have to do to fix my husband? What do I have to do to fix my wife? What do I have to do to fix my boss? What do I have to do to fix my situation? What do I have to do to fix everybody around me so that I don't have to change, so that they just can, you know, fit my world better? Can't. Commit yourself to God. And then let Him be Himself through you. Let Him worry about the judge and righteously part. And you can just be at peace with that. Now, I don't think you can be at peace with this. Well, good, they're going to get what they deserve. That's not what I'm talking about. The truth of the matter is you don't want what they deserve. See, you want your boy that wandered off and got into everything there is to get into to come back to God. But there are people out there that when he was into everything he got into, that those choices affected their kids. Now, if you're one of these parents over here, if you're not careful, you hope bad things happens, happen to that boy. But if you're this boy's parent, you're hoping that grace happens to this boy. And if you're God, which you're not, and I shouldn't say it like that, but God is wanting this boy to receive his grace. Amen. Okay? And he's wanting this person to let go of bitterness so they can enjoy God's grace. And he's wanting us all just to commit ourselves to him and let him be the righteous judge. You can trust the Lord. You don't have to fix all this stuff. And God wants us to even love mercy. And most of us do when it's applied to us. But that's not the kind of love and mercy he wants. He wants us to love mercy when someone else gets mercy. And then he really would love it if, if we actually loved mercy when someone who did something against us received mercy and we loved that. That's when you know you're healed. That's when you know you really gave it to God. When somebody that's really, really mistreated you gets the mercy and grace of God poured out on them, and you can say, praise the Lord. 
who is, this verse 24 now, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live under righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Now turn with me to Acts chapter 24. I want you to see something. A lot of stuff in the Bible you may say to yourself, well, that is hard. Okay, you're getting close. Well, it's really hard. I've tried for a long time getting closer. I just don't think I can do it. You're getting hot. Okay? I can't do it. And you fall on your face before God and say, God, you're telling me stuff in the word of God I cannot do. And if you're serious about it, you're just going to have to do it through me. He's serious about it. And he can do it through you. But as long as you think that you can do it, you're never going to get there. So it's good to go through this terrible process and finally realize, I can't do it. So Acts 24, verse 16 says, And herein do I exercise myself. There's that nasty word. It should be four letters, but I spell it with more. And herein do I exercise myself. How many of you have clothes racks, like really expensive clothes racks at your house? They look like treadmills, but they're really clothes racks. And they, they look like ellipticals, but everyone really knows they're just clothes racks. Because why? Those people are lying to you on TV. Yeah. <laughs> Chuck Norris. I like Chuck Norris. He's supposed to be a Christian. It's fun. It's fun. You know, his wife's got a big old grin on her face. We're enjoying this time together. You're lying. And your stuff is so low to the ground, it's a horrible clothes rack too. It's because it's not easy. It's exercise. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. Ugh. To, the, to really try to make sure that as far as you know, you're not offended by anyone else and they're not offended by you. To the best of your ability and understanding, which is limited, it really is limited. But when God does make it known to you, you could exercise. You could go through whatever it takes to go through to talk to the person and make it right. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. It's worth it. Most believers, if you've been saved very long, you know what it's like to carry this big old burden around while you're trying to fix it, whatever it is. You know what it is to carry all this guilt around while you're trying to fix it, whatever it is. And if hopefully you've been saved long enough that you also know what it's like when you actually give it to God and He just lifts that burden and everything's like it's all new again. He never left you. He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. He didn't ever leave you, but it just feels like it's all new again. It feels like a fresh start. When I trust God, when I actually give him these burdens of mine and quit trying to take care of them all myself. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. We love him because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. Now he's not maybe lying about hating his brother. So what's he lying about? Whether he loves God. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. God's love, it's real. If it's real, we're going to love our brother too. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. So I was trying to explain God's blessing to the kids a few weeks ago, and I'll try to be quick here, but in Psalm 15, it talks about how you get really close to God. 
But the thing is, he lives in you. Now, I realize in the Old Testament, he'd come upon people, and he'd be with people. In the New Testament, he lives in people. Okay, in our time, uh, the way that God deals with mankind right now, we call this a dispensation. The way he deals with us right now, when you're born again, Jesus comes to live in your, hearts, in your heart by faith, Ephesians 3, 17. Uh, Ephesians 1, 13 and Ephesians 4, 30. The Spirit of God comes to live in you. He's sealed in you until the day of redemption. So how can I get closer to God? He lives in me. It's not that you get closer to God, and it's not that he gets closer to you, but you don't feel very close to God. So I was trying to illustrate this with, with the kids. So, you know, your mother asks you to dump the garbage, and you say yes, and the moment she leaves, you go do what you want. But the whole time you're doing what you want, you're thinking about, I'm supposed to be dumping the garbage. So she comes back in, and you have one of those garbages that slide in, and they shut the door, and she says, did you dump the garbage? And you say, yeah, I dumped it, yeah. You're just hoping she'll leave the room again so you can go get it dumped. But in the meantime, is she still your mother? How motherish? I mean, like, what percent of mother is she still? 100%. How do you feel about that? Don't feel very close to my mom. These kids were amazing. I don't feel very close to my mom. Why not? Is she any less mother to you than she was five minutes ago? No. But you know that you're not right. You know that you're disobeying her. You know that you're defying her. You know that you're deceiving her. And we can't deceive God, but we, we can know that what we're doing is in direct opposition to his will, and we're not going to feel very good about that. So keep that in mind as you read Matthew chapter 5 here with me. In verse 23, it says, Therefore, if, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. It affects our worship with God when we know that we're harboring things in our hearts against man. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Sometimes husbands and wives think, well, you know, Nobody knows we're not getting along. Nobody knows we're struggling. Nobody knows we're fighting all the time. Nobody knows that the littlest thing at our house turns into the biggest thing at our house because somewhere in that parking lot out there, there's this line that you can't see, but when you cross it, smiles just come over your face. And it doesn't really matter what happened between the house and that line because once you cross the line, New vocabulary pops into the brain. <laughs> new words come out of the mouth. New facial expressions. I'm at church. And you don't have to do that, by the way. It's okay. We, we all know that uh, you don't always get along, okay? But even if, even if you think you got us all fooled, you know? Uh, how do we know this? Because we don't always get along, even though sometimes we're trying to fool you. Okay, so... But it, is it a big deal? It's a big deal. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7 says, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life. Why? That your prayers be not hindered. How you treat one another in the home affects your prayer life. I want to be able to get these burdens off of my shoulders. I don't want to be bitter anymore. I don't want to have wrath in me anymore. I don't want to have explosions anymore. I don't want to have to go around explaining myself of why what I just did was justified. And I, I'm really tired. Even when I tell the whole story, people still aren't impressed with what, I, with what I did at the office or what I did at church or what I did in the home or whatever. I'm tired of this. Okay. And you're going to need to forgive them. You're going to have to, like, no longer hold them accountable like they don't owe you anything anymore. But I don't know how. Talk to God about it. He forgave you. He forgave you like this. He threw it as far as the east is from the west. Buried in the deepest sea. Doesn't bring it up anymore. I'm not God. I know. But he still is. And he lives in us. And you can talk to him about this. And you can say stuff like, I, I need you to give me the strength to let go of this through me. 
I need you to give me the strength and the faith. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. God doesn't ask you to do things that he won't provide the faith through his word so that he can do them through you. You have to trust him. You have to give it to him. And here's the problem with giving it to him. <laughs> the same heart and hands that give it to him can reach back out and grab it back. So then you've got to have that discussion. Lord, I gave it to you. And I was, oh, it was such a nice day. It was a wonderful 10 minutes, you know. And then about the time I was thinking it was, I was going to live like this for the rest of my life, I reached back out and grabbed it again. And more likely what would happen is some event would happen, some thing would happen, some song would come on. I mean, I don't even know all the different ways, but your mind just so quickly would somehow go right back to that moment. And you weren't planning on it, but there it is. And like Billy Sunday said, you can't keep a bird from flying over your head, but you can keep it from building a nest in your hair. Okay, the thought came, boom. But what are you going to do with it? Are you going to just dwell on it again and get yourself all upset again? Or are you going to say, Lord, please, I want you to take captive my thoughts. I want to bring them into sub subjection to the word of God. I want you to take this thought away from me, and I want to think about you, and I want to think about your cross, and I want to think about your forgiveness, and I want to think about your goodness, and I don't want to be... I don't want to go back to being angry and bitter. Take over for me. And he will. And this, I, I think people are wanting me to give them some kind of a, this is all you do. You come down here on the third step. Make sure that your arms touch the third step. If you can get a tear or two out, that always helps. And then you'll never have the thought come back for the rest of your life if you do it just right. It's not going to happen. It's not how it works. It's going to be a battle for a while of dying to self and dying to self. And, and, and I mean for a while it's going to be a harder battle. And then after you think it's all gone, it's going to pop back up now and then. You're going to have to put it to death again. And give it back to God again. And give it back to God again. And give it back to God again. But you don't want to dwell on it because that's what made us bitter and angry and wrathful and angry and, and explosions and clamor and evil speaking and being so critical and carnal and everything else we already talked about for all those weeks. We don't want to go back to that. So let's don't. Now go back with me to Ephesians 4 and we'll, we'll close here. Ephesians 4. Verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. He's God the Holy Spirit. He doesn't leave so he can be grieved. He's not going anywhere. He's going to stay right inside you. He's sealed in you till the day of redemption. That's what the Bible says. It says in Ephesians 1.13 that he's sealed in you, that he's the earnest of the promise, that he is like, like when you put down that earnest money. Here is what God put down as earnest money in every believer, himself. He would have to deny himself to deny you because he is in you. You are, if you're born again, you're born again. I mean, it's, you can't, you're not going to become unborn again. You can sure feel like it. And we can do all the sins that we could do before we were saved. And get all wrapped up in all the bad stuff that just brings us down and, and just that we don't like. So it says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed on the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Let the Lord do that through you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father.